are good at one thing and some of us are good at being influential on mankind. Just so you know, and in the program booklet you saw this, Dr. Rabowski graduated from Hampton University at the age of 19 with a degree in mathematics and he graduated with high honors. Skip Fennell, our beloved former president of NCTM, says Rabowski is an American hero. Skip says that it's his spirit and passion that is felt just as strong in a one-on-one -on -one conversation as they are on the national stage. He also says, I see him as a person who, when you're in his presence, you know it. He's going to make you feel like what you say is extremely important. That's the true mark of a great leader. Dr. Rabowski has served as president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County since 1992. He has extensive research and publications focusing on science and math education. He chaired the National Academies Committee that recently produced the report, Expanded Underrepresented Minority Participation, America's Science and Technology. In 2008, he was named one of America's best leaders by U.S. News and World's Report, which in 2009, 2010, and 2011 ranked UMBC as the number one up-and-coming university in the nation. In 2011, U.S. News also ranked UMBC fourth nationally for best undergraduate teaching. It tied with Yale and was immediately before Brown and Stanford. Dr. Hrabowski says the school's successes are rooted in a simple philosophy. Any student, no matter the background, can be educated. In 2009, Time Magazine named him one of America's 10 best college presidents. And last Wednesday, he was named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time Magazine. It is with deep gratitude and honor for NCSN to welcome Dr. Rabowski to open the floor. that's a bit different. How many of you read Daniel Pink's book, A Whole New Mind? And you know he talks about the left and right brain approaches. And how many of you read his new book called Drive? And we talk about what's on the inside, right? How many of you love mathematics? Right. Oh, wow, that's amazing. I've never had a group like this before. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what I need your help. How many of you know that a lot of students in school, K through 12, colleges, universities, are bored every day? Okay. I love the fact that you're honest, too. This is good. This is good. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to do something for me. This room right now reflects what we see in education. I want you to think broadly, away from the way you're accustomed to thinking for a moment. And you come into a convention center. It's early in the morning. You don't have to teach or supervise people. You can sit back and relax and listen to people and reflect. Uh, and I think about the fact that many of my students immediately like to be in the back of the room so they can be as far away from me as possible when I'm talking to them. I'm going to ask everybody to come forward and to come to the center because it is very difficult to connect to you when you wave back then I can't see you. If you could come up, if everybody could get up out of your seats, if you're young enough to get up and come on to the front and be as... <laughs> Let's be out of the box. Let's be in the spirit of a whole new mind. Let's get more connected because there's something about community in a classroom, in a university, among math people that can make for a powerful experience when we are disjointed and people are just friends like this. You don't get that sense of working together. So if you could come to the first half, everybody come to the first half. I know you don't want me to move you, but please. In the spirit of a whole new mind, if you're young enough to be here, you're young enough to get up, come on to the front. Thank you very much. And you, you will feel what I'm saying. Come on to the front and this, so I can see you. Please, come on up. I know I'm taking a risk by doing this, but I promise you it will be a better experience if you're not way back there not getting a chance to connect to what I'm saying. And this is what we need to do with our students. We've got to build community among students. We can't just have them like this. We are so accustomed to just doing it as it is. No. And the spirit of a whole look, come on up. Now, as you would tell your students, you don't need to talk too much. Just come on up. <laughs> just come on up.
Come right on, please. I really appreciate people coming forward. I really do. I really do. This is this is if, if you if you can't feel the difference, believe me, as I'm connected to you, if I were a teacher and you were the students, it makes all the difference when you begin to feel that you're working with a group of people with whom you can connect in some way. How many of you have been in this business of education for at least five years? Ah. Uh, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. If you've been in this business 30 or more, stand up. Let me look at you. Wow. Very, very nice. You look good. You look very good. You look good. You really do. You really do. How many of you? are between the ages of 35 and 70. Let me see your hands. <laughs> wow. I've got good news and bad news. Which one you want first? <laughs> the, the good news is that you are the most educated human beings on the face of the earth, with the exception of one group of people, and that would be one country that's slightly better educated. Do you know who they are? Canada, exactly. Slightly better educated. Canada. I know she's here though. Uh huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> They're our neighbors. We're friends. We're friends. Um, how many? Anybody between 25 and 35? Very right, nice. You know you're smart. You've got to be in this room. And you're, if you're that age, first of all, you're, you're really smart. If you're in this group, this is supposed to be the people who really supervise the math, right? So if you're in that age group, we know you know you're smart, right? We know. We know. But I got good news and bad news. Which one do you want first? The bad news for you. The bad news is you're not as smart as we are. <laughs> Because see, we're number two in the world, you guys are number seven in the world. Now the good news is, we are jealous as hell because we want to be your age, all right? <laughs> so enjoy being young. Enjoy. Give the young people a hand. It's been wonderful that they're here. Wonderful that they're here. And here is what I want you to think about. Each of us has a story, and anybody who's heard me speak knows that I talk about stories. You know, I'm from Baltimore, which I call the Upper South. Uh, one day we're Philadelphia, the next day we're Richmond. <laughs> but I grew up in the Deep South, and in the Deep South we really love stories. Anybody from the Deep South? Hello, yeah. How many of you saw that uh, that movie years ago called uh, Still, Still Magnolia? Dolly Parton. Yeah. Remember when somebody's in the beauty parlor and they're telling, it's obvious they're lying, and everybody's looking at each other, knowing they're lying, and they leave, and Dolly says, there's a story there. But the fact is, we all have stories, and I've told this so many times, but it, it's at the heart of my thinking about mathematics. My mother says that when she was growing up in the late 20s and early 30s in rural Alabama, and I grew up in Birmingham, she's from below Montgomery, a place called Wetumpka, that she had a choice of working in a hot cotton field or working in a wealthy home, what she called, thought of as a wealthy home, a white home. And she worked in that home from about age 12 on through high school. And the home had a library. And at that time, there was no library for children of color. The only book in her home, a wonderful book, the Bible. But the woman was very kind to her and said, Maggie, when you finish your work, you can go into the library and read. And mother began to read in the library. And then the woman would say, take your book home, bring it back when you finish. And all of a sudden, my mother realized that her girlfriends were getting very upset with her. Because they would say, Maggie, come on outside and play. And she said, no, I want to stand and keep reading my book. And there she began to see, at that point, the difference, this growing difference between herself and her girlfriends. And here was the difference. Mother said the more she read, the better a reader she became. And the more proficient a reader she became, the more she enjoyed the experience. And the more she enjoyed reading, the more reading she did. The problem, she said, with her friends was they never read enough to become good at it, and therefore only do it when they had to. And she watched them frowning, moving their lips as they were trying to read. And they finally put the book down and said, it's not interesting. And it was clear to her, nothing is interesting if you can't do it well, when it's painful. 
At that point, she knew exactly what she wanted to do for the rest of her life to become a teacher. She always said, we work with every child in the world. One of my mother's favorite authors was Zora Neale Hurston, who wrote during the Harlem Renaissance in the 20s. And mother would be washing dishes and quoting. And I'd be saying, why are you, why are you talking? And she'd just laugh. And now I think about what she said. The book, Their Eyes Were Watching God, by Hurston begins this way. Ships at a distance have every man's wish on board. For some, they come in with the tide. For others, they sail forever on the horizon, never out of sight, never landing, until the watcher turns his head away in resignation, his dreams mocked to death by time. That is the life of men and women. Hurston was talking about two groups of people in our society, people like us, people whose dreams in many ways have already been fulfilled. And then she was talking about all those Americans whose dreams are, in the words of Winston Hughes, forever deferred. It occurs to me that the reason you do the work you do, the reason you're here today, is that you understand that the difference between those whose dreams are fulfilled and those whose dreams are deferred is education. Where would anyone in this room be if you had not been fortunate enough to get an education? Now let me ask another question. How many of you love to read? Very good, very good. I've already asked the question about mathematics. When I ask any American audience, and I do several times per week, from CEOs to teachers to superintendents, when I ask the question about reading, everyone raises the hand because we consider it necessary for any educated person to love to read. Now, the fact is, about half of you really love to read. The others just read the sports section or whatever it is. <laughs> there is a difference between loving novels, for example, right, and just knowing how to read. But here's my point. When I ask American audiences how many people eat, love to read, even superintendents, perhaps 20% will say yes. In fact, usually people giggle. And after the session, somebody will say, especially if I have parents in the room, they'll say, how can you put love and math in the same sentence? <laughs> right? You get that all the time. Uh, and so what I want you to think about this morning is that the way we think about ourselves as professionals, as a society, the language that we use, the way we interact with each other, the values we hold most important will be so critical in our lives, we become like that which we love. This notion of life and, and liberty and math for all. The fact is that in our country, Americans don't really think math is for all. They would say, if you had a math major, you're smart. Am I right? <laughs> Everybody knows you're smart. Okay? Uh, but they'll say, it just wasn't for me. In fact, when I, let me ask you this question. How many of you, by the time you were in the 10th or 11th grade, knew that you were either a math science type or a history, English, and art type? It's an American phenomenon, right? Now, the question I want you to think about for the rest of your conference is, how did you know? Most people would say, oh, well, I was just better in the other thing. And, you know, interestingly enough, my mother, uh, was an English teacher at first, and she loved it because people told her she was special when she was reading, her language skills developed, she could write well, she developed confidence, she had a sense of context, she understood what it meant to be a poor little girl, but she knew about the possibilities, and that's why she was aspiring to become a teacher. Years after she had been teaching, something came out called the new map. Anybody old enough to remember the new map? Yeah. Oh, yeah. One of the reasons the new math did not get as much of a positive impact as we might think, I would say is the fault of people at universities, people like me. Why? Because so often for years, university people thought they had all the answers. And while we may have understood the theories of inset theory, we did not, we do not know children. Most people at universities really don't know children. And even the experts who teach in teacher ed programs, I'm always saying to colleagues, get out there into the schools. Not for an hour, get out there and understand what teachers are going through. You can't do it in six hours. It takes time to appreciate that teacher-student relationship and the challenges that children face coming from all kinds of homes. 
especially today. And what happened was we went out with our arrogance, our condescending approach, and before you knew it, some people were even more frightened than they were before. <laughs> not, a, not, a, not a pretty picture. Well, my mother's school came to me at the time. Everybody was too afraid to go and learn this new math. And she said, she was the eighth grade English teacher. She said she was a specialist in English. She said, I'll go back and learn it. And I became her guinea pig. <laughs> So she went back and amazingly, uh, starting when I was about in the sixth grade, so by the time I was in the eighth grade, I was in her class. But, but for two years, I watched her taking these classes that were preparing her to be this math specialist. And what came through that became her philosophy of education, and quite frankly mine, is that there is this inextricably strong link between language skills and mathematics. What people don't understand is that we don't talk about problems in numbers. We talk about problems, whether in biology, ge genetics, or in chemistry, or in engineering, or whatever, or in statistics, in words. And to translate from the words to the symbols to get to the equations that kids like, the fact is you have to be able to read well. When I've written the questions for the SAT, and when I have people math questions for years and earlier years, and people would say, oh, that test is biased. And I said, well, I think I'm black. I don't know, but I think I'm black. If you look at me, right? I wrote some of those questions, right? What I know is that a child who learns to read and think critically of any race, both genders, can learn to do those problems and do well. I come from a campus that has students from 150 countries. One of the reasons we're such an exciting place, we are in Baltimore, we're actually outside of the city, we're there at the uh, BWI airport, 500 acres. It, it is a, an amazing place. We keep the numbers fairly small, mid-sized. We've got 13,000 students, of whom 3,000 are grad, PhD in, in science and engineering and policy areas, but about 10,000 undergrad, 9,000 full-time, most freshmen and sophomores on campus. Here's the point. We have the highest percent of students in science and engineering graduating. We have uh, almost 50% graduating. Give us a big hand for that. Uh, in science and engineering. And it is a campus that has, uh, as I said, the 150 uh, countries represented. So there's a lot of international diversity. But we also talk about the domestic diversity. So we've got maybe 14%. 14% African American, another 4%. Uh, Hispanic, almost 5%, and, and we're the largest producer among predominantly white universities of African Americans who go on to complete PhDs in STEM areas and MD PhDs. Give me a big hand for that. And so one of the reasons that the Ivies and others have made us this number one up and coming based on academic innovation is that they see such a large percent of our students, 40%, going on to grad school of all races. And most important, we have done what few, if any, others have been able to do, and that is to educate not only my white and Asian students, but my black and Latino students at a level that allows them to go on and complete these PhDs and go in the faculties of the best places. How did we do it? It takes faculty ownership of any issue. It is, the, it is the faculty, it will be the teachers working with supervisors and others that can really understand the dynamics of what's going on in order to get concepts across. Now, what is interesting about America right now is that few people understand the impact of this additional three billion people in our economy in the world, China and India. Let me ask a question that will sound politically incorrect. I'd rather upset you than bore you, okay? Here we go. How many of you believe there are many more brilliant Chinese and Indian children than American children? Very good. You're a smart group. You really are. Most Americans get very upset when I say that because they think to themselves, what do you mean? Don't you believe in your country? Our children are as smart as anybody else. But that's not my question. My question was about numbers. You got 1.3 billion Chinese, 1.1 billion Indians. Now remember this. You put those two together, you have 2.4 billion people. The top 10% of any population will be extraordinary. What is 10% of 2.4 billion? <laughs> I know you're going to tell me. No other American group has done this, but what is it? What is it? Huh? I wish you could see your faces right now. I love it. This is, I just wanted to make you feel like you were taking a test. That's what I'm not. So you can empathize with this too. 240 million, right? Now, how many Americans are there in total? 
about 350, almost 320, all right? So here's my point. There are almost as many geniuses from those two populations as we have citizens. No wonder they eat our lunch in every PhD program in America. They are, I mean, my campus innovation, and they're wonderful. I mean, it's great to see this kind of brain power. Here's the other point. You may not know it, but the, literally more than half of all the Nobel laureates throughout the 20th century, from the sciences to the humanities, in America, had parents from other countries, usually European countries. Often the kids grew up in New York. They went to the poor man's uh, Harvard, City College, Brooklyn College, for little or no money, and they were the best, and they went on to the next level, and their parents didn't even speak English well. What did they have? It was the hunger for the knowledge. It was a belief that America, in America, one could do anything with hard work, and it made all the difference in the world. But what's interesting about some campuses, including mine, is my students who come from other countries inspire, push, motivate my other students. The kids who come from China or from Russia or from Jamaica or from Barbados, it's amazing the difference. They are saying all the time, how high should I jump, sir? They, that, that kind of attitude. Their cousins who grew up outside of D.C., what's up, Doc? <laughs> right? You know, why must I do that? Right? And so that attitude is an important factor and the notion of believing if you work pretty hard, you can do anything. Now, why do I bring this up? If we know we cannot be competitive as a nation based on numbers, what we have that we must use will be creativity and innovation. Everybody knows that there's something about the American spirit, the entrepreneurial spirit, that makes all the difference in the world. But here is the challenge. If we continue to think that only the top 5 to 10% of kids can be math majors, we're losing out on so much more talent. But if we require the leaders to help change our attitudes about who can succeed in math. Does that mean that everybody's going on to get a grad degree in abstract algebra? No. It does mean, based on common core standards, we get students through a level of proficiency in statistics, for example, that they're able to apply the math in the social sciences. Do you know many of my humanities students are doing fascinating combinations of programs in computing and statistics because it allows them to do so much more? It's amazing what a difference it makes in the hands-on experiences. And the question when we think about common core standards, for me, goes back to what I said about my mother, and it's this. How do we help our teachers and others develop clarity in the language used to explain concepts to people? I often say to my students in science and tech, until you can explain that concept to a child, you really don't understand that it's not enough to tell me it's too complicated to understand. That we must find ways of doing that. And what I like about this Common Core Standards, as we talk about consistency across the country, is everything from teaching students how to look at patterns, how to persevere, how to understand numbers and expressions, and you move up that ladder to functions and modeling. And, and here is the key. How do we help people really believe, when you talk about the, the gap between knowing and doing, how do we help people believe that math really does relate to life itself? Now, the advantage my campus has is that we have students who are working in all of our, we have companies on campus. We have 75 biotech and IT companies on campus. And I've got math, science, engineering types working in all those companies. And then we are the second uh, largest feeder to the National Security Agency, which is 20 minutes from my campus. You know, NSA, no such agency. Uh, that's what it's called. NSA is really like because it is the largest employer of mathematicians in the world. It is the most fascinating place to work if you love mathematics. And it's supposed to be a secret, but we all know there are 20,000 people there. <laughs> Heavily PhDs. Well, 885 are my graduates. My goal is to get to 1,000. And then I've got hundreds of students who are math majors, computer science majors, working there with security clearances while still in college. What makes that so exciting is the first thing they want to say to me is, Doc, I can't tell you what I'm working on because if I did, I'd have to kill you. They love telling me that. And every time a little sophomore says, I say, you think I've heard that before? Maybe. Maybe. You know, people love that. But here's the point. While they're in classes, they're also doing work that relates to the classes, and it makes all the difference in the world. And then when you talk about the hottest area in computing right now, remember this, is cybersecurity. And, and the people in cybersecurity love mathematicians. So all of my math kids have offers from SNSA, from uh, SAIC, and they think about grad school. And what NSA says, what SAIC will tell you is, come on here, take
take courses in the evening at UMBC, uh, at Hopkins, whatever. You can get a grad degree, but get into the field and start working. And what makes the cybersecurity even hotter today is that the general, General Alexander, the head of NSA, just told Congress, no longer can we think about protecting ourselves in cybersecurity. We must look at ways of becoming offensive that China has moved to become much more obvious, so they're diving into our systems without our knowing it. We have not developed the curriculum at places to do it. My campus is working now with NSA to develop that kind of curriculum so that curriculum so that people, so that our, our Americans can quite frankly look to see how others are working to tap into what we have even more quickly. Why do I tell you this? I am, go read General Alexander's speech to Congress. This came out in the last month. Math majors, People with math backgrounds, not just to make just a few courses, can do all sorts of things. You'd be surprised at the number of English, philosophy, history majors who take a few math courses, a few computer courses, and can really move into areas that allow them to use their language skills to connect the techies to the non-techies. Because the biggest problem with my computer science side is they don't know how to talk to people. I'm having to say, text them on English, boy. Learn how to talk, how to write, how to present, and stop looking with such arrogance at people who don't understand. Now, there's where I want to get you to work with your teachers, because let me tell you what I know, because I'm in schools a lot. We have wonderful, I love math teachers. Anytime somebody's a math, I love it. But I can see a teacher looking at a kid that says this, okay, I'm going to help you do this semester, don't come back here next year. Do you get what I'm saying? You know, we have a way of thinking. Well, you can get it like this. My mother, I got my worst grades in my mother's class. I always, I mean, I've, I've always been a nerd, fat nerd. My, 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 my son says, Dad, you're not just a nerd, you're a mega nerd. <laughs> but, now, I should tell you, I'm a campus of, we are a campus of nerds because we are either number one or number two in chess every year in the nation. Give us a big hand for that. <laughs> chess. You see a chess player on my campus is bowing reference, all right? Uh, it's very important. And my basketball team can read well and they graduate. Give me a big hand for that. <laughs> big hand. They may not win. On the cross team, just these studio all of you, I'm very proud of that, and they do well. But the point is, uh, by the way, my son says, Dad, you and Mom are, are, are mega nerds. Now, he's 35, and I always say, yeah, but mega nerds can pay their bills all the time. If you, <laughs> if you got adult kids, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Give me a hand for mega nerds, please. It's okay to make that part. And the point I'm making is this. Here, you, you don't think of yourselves this way, but if you're the supervisors of math teachers, people know, first of all, you're real smart because you did well in math yourself. But secondly, that you've got these leadership skills and you can help lead all these smart people. So you really do represent the best of thinkers in our K-12 system. I would argue that what I'm working to do at the university level and at K-12 is what I want you to do, and that is to help children and teachers to want to be smart. And to me, smart means excited about the ideas, willing to work hard, fascinated with solving problems, willing to discuss issues, and having the life of the mind at the center of what we do. We tend to think more comfortably about other things when we say American Idol. Think about the values in our country. American Idol, it's entertainment. What was so, so much of an honor for me in getting this time award is that usually, and I'm going to say it here, usually when blacks have been on that list, two or three a year, they're always entertainers or athletes. And for them to put me on that list, they know that my message is math is something that rocks, that we believe in that tomorrow night and I'm going to talk about the importance of teaching all of our children that they are smart, that they can do this, that it has to do with how hard they're willing to work and that we have to get our communities involved and our parents involved and our administrators involved because I will tell you when I talk to big administrative groups I give them a math problem and many of them have faces that say why would you be giving us a math problem? I want you as supervisors of math to go back and say, Dr. Rossi said you, the principal, the superintendent, need to be even more interested in mathematics than you are. Give me a hand for that, please. Give me a hand for that. Because I am saying that the person doesn't have to be able to solve the problem in order to show interest in the problem, you see. I mean, I, the two books that I wrote on raising smart black boys and smart black girls in science and math, one of the points was that many of these parents had no college education. How did they help their kids? By asking questions. 
How many problems did you have to work on today? Show me your notes from today. What problems did you have to do? You did, you had 10 problems, you did seven. Why didn't you do the other three? You don't understand. What is it you don't understand? Write down what you don't understand, talk to the teacher tomorrow, and then tomorrow night I want you to tell me what the teacher said. You get my point? There are ways that parents can be involved without even knowing the math, which will send the message to the child that this work is important. It's the involvement by parents, by administrators, by principals. I'll never forget when my principal, who was a mathematician, would come in every day to our math class, put a math problem on the board and leave. And if you could solve it throughout the day, you could get a nickel. And that was a lot of money. Because with a nickel, I could buy five Tootsie Rolls. I love it. Now keep in mind, my mama kept getting me to do more math word problems by giving me incentives like uh, blueberry pie. By, by so, I, so I'd be eating blueberry pie all over my face and doing math, and I was getting fat and smart all the time. <laughs> you know, and in the deep stuff, they like an addict. So I was, it, was, it, was, it was good. It was good. But the point is, you know, we tend to think about kids who can get things like this as the smartest in America. I've spent time in Japan and Asian countries, and a, a Japanese mother may have two kids. One gets like this, the other may take longer, but she'll say they'll both get A's, they'll both get this fine. Expectation. We tend to think, if they get like this, that's the best person. My mother, the reason I got less than A's, I got two B's in her class, was that she knew I knew how to memorize anything. I wouldn't really think about it, I just memorize it. You may not know this, but if you can give the teacher exactly what the teacher said, the teacher thinks you're brilliant. <laughs> oh my God, this is wonderful. And she saw me doing that all the time, just, just regurgitating. And so she would give us some of the problems from two weeks ago on the current test. You see what I'm saying? Just to see what we were remembering. And what she always said was sometimes when a child takes longer to get something, it becomes a part, it becomes a part of them. See how that became a part of me? The, you know, it's the idea that sometimes when you struggle with something, once you get it, you got it. Sometimes when it comes too easily, yeah, you get it, then you lose it because you didn't have time to reflect on it. And that's a part of the issue in America that we have to understand. Children learn in different ways. They have attitudes that are very different. They have a different pace depending on the child. And yet, if we believe they can all do it and we teach them to persevere, we can have many more students doing well and pushing them because nothing takes the place of hard work. On our, give me a hand for that. It's a very important point. I need to give you, I don't want to have time for questions, I want to give you one piece of the National Academy's report that I think you might find shocking. The fact is that it doesn't surprise people that only 20% of blacks and Hispanics who begin with a major in math, science, and engineering actually graduate with a major in math, science, and engineering. That's not surprising. What percent of white Americans do you think who begin with a major in science or engineering or math actually graduate with a major in one of those areas? It's only 32%. 32%. And then for the highest achieving group, Asian Americans, right? What percent do you think? I heard somebody said 90, but what else? It's only, it, it, believe it or not, it's only 42%. Okay? Now, here is the first thing college professors will say. It's okay through 12 off. It's very, have you ever noticed, universities bring high schools, high schools bring middle schools, middle schools bring elementary and kindergarten, and they bring the families, right? So one of our challenges is to stop blaming everybody. I just finished uh, being a PI on a big NSF grant, because I'm, I'm in schools a lot with a couple of my folks, working in the Baltimore area uh, on a math science partnership focused on middle school. And uh, big grant, big grant, 12, 13 million dollars, and a part of it was to bring in engineers and scientists who wanted to become teachers. They, they have the math and science. They've got great applications that they can use, which we need. We need teachers having more applications. We know that. Uh, that because the kid will ask, where would I use this? Why is this important? And it's not enough to say because it teaches you to think well. Right? You've got to have context, ways of, of talking about it. Some of the best algebra I've seen taught has been in GED out in California in green construction jobs where they're actually doing work problems involving building something and they're using the concepts and before they know it, they're doing the math. It's amazing the difference. But here is what, what is really powerful that I want you to think about. It really is not just about K through 12. 
It is about universities. What shocked people was when I ended up as chair, the group from Harvard and MIT all the way to Howard and to the University of Texas saying, big part of the problem is us looking in the mirror at universities. We in universities call the first year of math and science, according to NSF, weed out courses. And every campus expects most people not to make it. Why do I say that? Because all you have to do is look at the second year of the work, and there are about one third the number of seats we plan for. You get my point? At all kinds of campuses. And here is the final statistic that will shock you. This will sound counterintuitive, so listen carefully. The higher the SAT, the higher the AP credits in math and science, the more prestigious the university, the greater the probability that the person who begins in science, pre-med, engineering, will leave it within a year or two. Did you get that? So I want you to think about that because the high schools are always proud when they send people on to the most expensive, the places where the most wealthy people go, right? We said, oh, we had that many go there to become engineers, to become doctors. What I want you to do is go and see what happens to them. They become great lawyers. They change their majors. And if you ask them why, they can say, well, I just like that better. Well, if you get a C or D in math or science or A in English, of course you like English better. Am I right? And this is what students see. This is what my students see. They say, Doc, I worked so hard all weekend long in chemistry, in math, and I got a C in the test. My friends were in political science. They put in two hours and they got A's. It's not fair. Well, the fact is, to make it in math and science, because of the nature of our disciplines, you do have to work much harder. There's no doubt about that. There's no doubt about that. Because if you can read and write well, and think critically, you can at least get a B in the social sciences and humanities. Those, now those courses are very important, but it's my point. We need them to put everything in perspective. They're at the heart of who we are as human beings. It is different, though, when talking about performance. And what I'm suggesting to you from your school systems is go and look. Get the learning analytics. That's another part of what I say. We tend to go with anecdotes, K-12 and universities. Oh, one student went to Harvard, one student went to this place, right? But to get the data to say what happened to even our best students, how many actually made it in math and science, and did they go into careers in those areas? My God, if you go to some of the best places in technology, will graduate, and they say, well, my dad made me stay here, and I finished it, but I don't ever want to see engineering again in my life. I'm going to law school, because it's easier. And so the challenge we face is to have more kids doing well in math, in general, to get more into stat areas like that, but secondly, to get more students moving on and staying in their careers, because here's the most frightening part of all. What percent of, in Europe, 12% of the 24-year-olds have degrees in science and engineering? In Korea, it's 70%. What do you think it is in America? 6%. Only 6% of Americans, 24-year-old Americans, one half of what we have in Europe. And for blacks and Hispanics, it's 2%. With blacks and Hispanics moving towards 40 some percent of the American population. The only way we can be competitive, the only way we can be able to work collaboratively as equals with the rest of the world is for people like you, the leaders in K-12, to help us have many more students succeeding in general in that, and then those who are going to careers in science and engineering. Just three areas that you should be talking about, I think, in terms of research. Number one, defense and intelligence. I can tell you, we cannot give enough jobs, or even mathematicians, computer scientists for DOD, CIA, FBI, all these places. For, our, for the rest of our lives, we're going to be involved in trying to win the peace, but also protecting ourselves. And math is at the heart of that work. Number two, health care. You cannot become a physician, you can't go into biochemistry if you don't have a strong math background. It's required in all those areas. And the third area that is really huge, energy and the environment. In each of these areas, strong math backgrounds will be critical, let alone what you do in the business world. If I want to get somebody to the Wall Street, let them be a quant, math, they can make all kinds of money. I like some of my graduates making a lot of money because they give you a good check, right? I have no shame with that. But my point is, what you do is more important to this country now than ever before. You know, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are people who can suck every ounce of energy out of your body because they're so negative. You know who some of them are in your school systems, right? Some of you sitting in this room right now. I'm just kidding, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Just kidding. Kind of, kind of, kind of. <laughs> but then there are people who can elevate you. You know, you meet them and times are hard and less money, and yet they say, we can get through this. Each of us 
has the opportunity to decide the kind of leader we will be. And I will tell you, the older we get, the greater the challenge to remain positive. Because when you've seen things not work, it's very easy to say, well, we've been there, done that, and it didn't work. I want you to think about the concept of neoteny. How many of you know what neoteny means? N-E-O-T-E-N-Y. If somebody knows what it means right now, I'll give you $1,000. Let me see the hand. <laughs> Now, you see, this, let me show you the difference between your generation and my students. Somebody would Google that immediately. They would have that answer, right? I see some trying to do it right now. Right. Too late, too late, too late. But it comes from the book Geeks and Geezers. It's a great book, Harvard Business School. We're a little book. It's on the people under 30 and over 70 who have the same quality. It's this amazing quality. It's about being childlike. It's about still wanting to discover new things. It's about having curiosity. I, Robbie, a Nobel laureate out of New York said when he was growing up, all of his friends' parents would say, did you, what did you learn in school today, at the end of the school day? He said, but not my Jewish mother. My Jewish mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And the practice of encouraging his curiosity, he said, made him the thinker he wanted to be. That's what I want you to get teachers to do, to help children to encourage that curiosity. Well, neoteny has to do with asking good questions all the time and believing that I don't care how bad it is, we can get through it. You know, my wife and I just celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Give her a hand for that. Give her a hand for that. And so we are always working with young couples and talking about marriage and spirituality and things like that. And one of the points we make is that our attitudes as husband and wives, our attitudes are critical. That if we don't have the attitude that says, I don't care what the problem is, we can get through this. We don't have that attitude, it, it just will not work. And so I want, when that neoteny comes up, look that term up. I want everybody here, whether you've been in education 20 years or 40, to think about that renewed vigor that encourages it. Because we need that when kids don't seem to be interested in the math. What, what's so funny about my campus, there's a piece on 60 Minutes. If you go to my, you'll see that 60 Minutes piece. You hear what people say, he's crazy. Because I'm all, it's true, I tell them, I get goosebumps through math problems. Goosebumps. All right. I always have. I first heard Dr. King speak in my hometown while I was in the back of the church, not wanting to be there, and my parents could get me to be there because I did let me do my math work in the back of the room. And I heard this man saying, if we, if we use kids in the march, these children can go to the best schools, meaning the white schools. I'm doing a math problem at that time. I'll never forget it. And it was when I, just like Bob Moses in the Alpha Project, it was so clear to me, I wanted to learn how to do those math problems. So when I got in that, that school that was supposed to be better than mine with those white kids, I wanted to show how smart I was. Because I knew I could work hard, and I was fascinated by the work. And I always think about that. I never could have imagined, as a little black child in Birmingham, becoming the president of a place that has students from 150 countries. I could never have imagined that Time Magazine would have me there talking about the excitement of education. But it all happened because of teachers and parents who said, you can do anything if you just work to be your best. You know, at the end of my mother's life, we had convinced her to come to Baltimore. Didn't want to leave Birmingham because of her church. I said, we have churches in Baltimore, Mama. You know, finally, you had your church, though. No church like your church. But she came up, this brilliant woman who quote Hurston and Shakespeare, all of a sudden we realized she had been so smart, she had been able to hide from us the fact that Alzheimer's was there. But she was so smart. Do you know one of the ways we finally realized she was having a hard time remembering who we were? One of the ways that she worked to keep strengthening herself, she would say a line in a poem and then I'd say a line because we'd learned poetry all of our life. And she was trying to remember the poems. And the other was, she made me give her word problems. I mean, and they would, and they would push her. She said, give me another one. You know, and constantly, she was working on word problems, just pushing it. And finally, we're sitting out on the, on the porch, and she said, I know the end is near. You don't want to hear your mama say that. Mm. She didn't even know who I was. She just knew I was familiar. But she had the sweetest smile. And she said, it's very close. And she's still sitting up, and I said, well, what's important to you? Because when somebody knows it's almost that time, you get the essence of the person. And she looked into my face and saw that I was trying not to cry, and she said to me what she said all my life, hold on to your faith. You 
will be okay, just hold on to your faith. And then she said, what's important to me? She said, with the sweetest smile, relationships. She said, my relationship with my God is there for us. And then she said, my relationship with my husband. She forgot daddy had died 20 years before. And then she shocked me. I'm an only child. She looked me right in my face and said, you know, I have a son. <laughs> and all of a sudden, my grief turned to anger. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, she's about to have a chance to give you a teenager. <laughs> I got a brother that I don't want at this point. She's going to drop this bomb on me and die. I was not a happy camper. All of my face was looking really mean. You know how the students said, TMI, too much information? I'm like, uh-uh. If -uh. you treat me like this, I'm looking really mean. And she smiles. She said, he's a college president. Thank God she's talking about me. <laughs> but finally, finally, she said something that I get to use a gift. She said, but you know, I now understand that teachers touch eternity through their students. Teachers touch eternity through their students. She said, whatever I had to give, my lust for learning, my belief in them, my telling them they could do anything, I gave that to them and I will live through them. I went back and spoke in Birmingham years after she had died and all these teachers came up to me and they said, your mama didn't just teach us to read, she taught us to love reading and mathematics. Your mama went into the projects to my grandmama's house and said, send your granddaughter to college. And my granddaughter, my grandmama said, no way, she's got to get a job and find a husband. And your mother convinced them the best thing for your granddaughter is college. And she filled out the financial aid forms for them and got more and more kids in. And each person said, and I went to college and, and I was able to get a job. And then my younger brothers and sisters got jobs. And all of a sudden, we could get our grandmama and our mama out of the projects all because that teacher told us we were special. And so I challenge you today to watch your thoughts, they become your words. Mm. Watch your words, they become your actions. Watch your actions, they become your habits. Watch your habits, they become your character. I tell my students, your character has everything to do with who you are, not only when people can see you, but what will you do when your mother's not there? <laughs> There's your character. So thoughts become words, words become actions. Actions become habits, habits become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Supervisors of mathematics, you are all so special, and you can be even better. Thank you all.